Is on? I did. All right, so uh, what, what I wanted to do today is a couple of things. First of all, let's get back to the uh, Word document, finish off some of the stuff that uh, I couldn't finish from last time, and then we'll continue with some. Uh, these are, let's say, real examples of real stocks and real charts that are examples of how the different chart types of patterns work. So I'm going to go through them and then I'll go with, get with some more, but this will be in later lectures. Well, here is something that's amazing. Uh, Jeff Nielsen sent me today about, it's from the Wall Street uh, Journal, January 31st, 2008. And it says, investors rush to gold. Remember, I was explaining this about last time. This is probably a superb indicator for a technician as to where and what the state of the gold market is. Investors rush to gold and the first sentence is, the new gold rush is on. What am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, number 15, market sentiment. And I'm talking about before that, you, you don't have to open a uh, b b bull phases, which is the second phase, big or institutional money. What I'm talking about is the following. For seven years in a row, from 2001 to 2007, gold has been in a relentless up move. Every single year, gold has delivered superb or stellar results. It was at the bottom at $2,050. It is today $940 earlier this morning. Now it's in the 920s. So gold has more than tripled, almost quadrupled. Price goes up in four times. And just recently, Wall Street takes a notice. What this means for technicians is that the first phase, which is the accumulation of smart money, is over. For seven years ran the first phase, and here is, I'm reading paragraph four out of, this is Mark Stern, Investors Rush to Gold, the Wall Street Journal, January 31st article. It says, today, a different class of entirely, uh, a different class entirely is po powering gold's rise. Mainstream investors and money managers who once shunned it. To shun means in English to avoid it. So now a new investor class, the money managers, which I sometimes call fund managers. The point I'm trying to make is first phase ran seven years from 2001 to roughly 2007, eight. Barely now money and fund managers are waking up. What this means is that gold, given in the second phase, and that the first phase has run roughly seven years, the second phase will run five, six, seven or eight more years, because barely now fund managers are waking up to the idea of gold, but they are not yet convinced. So once the second phase, uh, phase runs, then we get into the third phase where the small, tiny, little investor will be lining up for gold that will run for another three, four, five, you know, God knows how many years. So here now we have the, an indication that probably barely a third of this gold bull market has been on. And this is one of the most powerful tools that technical investors, meaning technicians, use. Okay? So it's a great indicator. So here's another one. Let me try this because you got to understand the other side of it. Uh, the precious metal has been a horrible hedge against inflation. This is pure 100% Wall Street propaganda, which serves Wall Street interests. They always, and this is superb, in Wall Street, this is a textbook example where Wall Street always points to gold in 1980 when it was $850 and then points a 20-year bear market. Peter Schiff has emphasized many times, why don't they point gold at 1970 when gold was 
$35 back then, all right? So 1970 gold was $35. Today gold is $930, roughly up 30 times. And gold has been superb inflation hedge. You cannot find a better hedge. No stock or anything else has been a better hedge against inflation. Possibly with the exception of crude oil. Crude oil back then was a dollar twenty-nine. Now it's hundred. Well, let me step back, step back a little further because that's an important topic. When it comes to inflation hedge in the 1970s, Wall Street as well as common sense people understood late in the 70s that the best inflation against hedge is crude oil, and the second best was gold, and that the third best was silver, okay? But the point is, when you pick the worst case scenario, in 1980 at the peak, and then you take it you know, up all the way to 2000 or 2008, of course it is a terrible hedge. It is a terrible hedge because it is based on a terrible analysis. What about this case? In 2000 or 2001, it was 255, and today 950 or 40. It is a brilliant hedge. I mean, you made a, would have made a lot of money. Personally, I invested a lot in a lot of silver in 2003. I was investing in silver, and silver was like four, four and a half dollars, uh, 430 to 470. That's where I got my silver. Now, silver is 17. My money has roughly quadrupled in four or well, five now short years. Here's something else I gotta tell you. That's a different story, but it's a, again in the technician's toolbox. In 2004, when I was in, uh, uh, visiting my friend, uh, he's a professor in finance, I told him about silver. It's a great investment, brilliant product. He said, no, 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 no. Silver is a really bad investment. Digital is killing silver in the sense that digital photo photography is killing. Well, how do you know that? Well, this is a, well, everybody knows that. It's a universal truth. I mean, every common sense person knows that digital is killing silver. So there you have a very good close friend of mine, you know, with you know, growing up together, who tells me that you know, without ever studying silver, that silver is a bad investment. So he went and talked to a bunch of other professors in the Department of Finance. That's Texas A&M. And all the other professors tell him, well, of course silver is a bad investment. You know, digital is killing silver. So what is a technician thinking about it? Technician thinks, great. Even if investors, meaning sophisticated investors like finance professors, haven't gotten onto this board, meaning on train and investing in it. If Wall Street is not onto it, it has got to be the case that it's one of the best investments in the world because no one is invested in it. If no one has invested in it, it's got to be dirt cheap. Well, now, at least five years later, we know that it was dirt cheap because back then it was around $4, 430 470 and now it is 17 at least today it was $17. So, this is the technician's way to think about the market. It is also known, but not quite, it's different implication, known as contrarian investing. You want to invest in something that no one else is investing in. Again, if everyone's already invested in houses and everybody knows about houses and everybody bought about houses, where is the next sucker going to come to buy the next house and drive the price higher? In other words, you already ran out of suckers or investors. There's nothing left but to sell. For silver, it's exactly the opposite. Now, the way technicians call this is the asset is underowned, unloved, and underinvested. And these are the assets that make the lot of money. All right, is that clear so far? All right, so remember last time when I was talking about, again, on market sentiment, that the market is a bear market goes down on the slope of hope. 
For a bull market, how do we call it? Because I missed it last time. Anybody? For bull markets, we call it bull markets rise a wall of worry. Or bull markets climb a, a wall of worry. Well, the gold market for the last seven years had been rising in a perfect wall of worry. Every time gold went up, Wall Street experts came and said, oh, it's coming back down. This is called, in slang, investor jargon, it's called gold bashing. They, Wall Street loves to bash gold because you know, gold is a bad indicator. Well, uh, Wall Street has been for the last seven years bashing oil. Every time oil went up a little bit, they said, oh, no, 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 it's coming back again and it's going lower. This is the end. So they never really trusted it. They never really believed in it. They never really invested heavily in it. And yet for seven years, well, of course, these are now the next uh, subject, fundamentals, because the fundamentals drove it. But technicians, of course, look at the fundamentals, but for them, the sentiment is clear. So this is now the big Wall Street, sorry, big gold community article uh, that now you have the entirely different class of the money manager. So now we can say clearly this is the beginning of the second phase of the bull market. If the first one lasted big, well only seven years, it is impossible that the second will last six months or a year. That has never been the case. Usually first phase, second phase, third phase, uh, usually last roughly, roughly equal in time. For example, let's take the gold bull market of the 70s. During that bull market, what happened? 1967 or 8, so maybe 9, uh, some of the gold bugs, these are, you know, guys who are highly sophisticated in, in gold and properties of gold and real money, etc., etc., were the first one buying, then French, etc., were buying. So, up until 1973, gold went up and only smart money was buying. From 73, there was a major market correction, or 74, uh, gold fell sharply. And then came the institutional investors from 73, 74, all the way to 78. And you may guess now what happens. The small investor was lining up the banks in 1979 and 1980. The point I'm making it is that the gold bull market has been in effect for 10 full years, from 68 to 78, and only in 78 the small investor began to invest in earnest, meaning in masses. Same thing with real estate market in Bulgaria. The beginning of the bull market was 1997. But only in 2003 the masses really began to invest in it. So again, that's the third phase indicator. So now, we are then at the beginning. If the first phase lasted six or seven years, you may be safe that the second phase is going to last another three, maybe four, maybe five years, and then you're going to get the third phase, okay? That will be the mania phase. So that's an extremely important indicator, and that's how technicians think about things. Let's see what else we have now. We have corrections. Well, corrections do occur. A correction is usually a major or sizable move in the opposite direction of the main trend. So, what we had was like for five years you had a major bull run, cyclical bull run in gold. That was the first phase. Then there was a major correction, sometimes defined, defined as more than 20% pull back, sometimes they define it differently. From the previous run, you take whatever the run-up was, 30 or 50% from that run-up, so it gives back some of the gains, like 30 to 50% of the previous run-up, and when you get a major correction, this usually means, a major, this usually means that now you're in the next stage or the next 
phase of the market. So the gold market actually experienced a similar correction like a year, year and a half ago. So now that the correction was over, it took about a year for the full correction to work itself out, then you begin the next major leg up. We call this a cyclical leg up because we have you know, secular bull market. So we have the first phase of the secular bull market from 2001 to maybe 2005 or 6. Then you have a one year correction and from 2007 you have the second, sec uh, sec second cyclical bull market which is the second cyclical part of the bigger secular cycle. Alright, so what do we have next? Uh, let's see. Confirmation and divergence. I'll skip this for now. There are some examples later. Now we have Dow theory problems. Uh, all right, so uh, a lot of people love to criticize the Dow theory. It is not infallible, number one. Of course, it has its faults. But number two, they think, especially people who really don't understand technical analysis, they believe that technical analysis should always tell you perfectly when to buy, and when to say that's not the case and the theory doesn't even try to do that it is trying a little other things so what are the problems changing interpretations this has been a common criticism that uh, Dow theory changes its interpretations the answer is no Dow theorists for almost 100 years have been remarkably consistent Students of the Dow theory or you know, people who think they use the Dow theory haven't been really good at it and they have been changing their opinions. The Dow theory is fairly stable, doesn't change its interpretations over time. But sometimes people that apply it, apply it wrongly or incorrectly and other people perceive it as changing interpretations. The other, much more important, which is not understood, Dow theory I showed you has a big 700 page book, very complicated, remarkably sophisticated. Sometimes people get to learn a few basic principles and they think that's the Dow theory. So when they see a different interpretation, they do not understand that this different interpretation is also part of the Dow theory. They perceive it as if the theory changed, okay? See the point? So the, power, the, the, the theory is a lot bigger and for outsiders unfamiliar with the theory, it appears to be a changing interpretation. Too late for signals. So in other words, Dow theory gives you a buy signal and it sometimes gives you a sell signal. Critics, critics say that Dow theory is too late. And the answer is, yes, it is too late. Yes, it provides a late signal. But Dow theory never ever tried and meant to or claimed that it picks the perfect bottom and it picks the perfect top. That's not the idea. The idea is that you get on the uptrend when you're more or less sure that it is, you ride it for a while, you make a good chunk of money, and then you're out of it. You don't have to pick the real bottom, and you don't have to pick the real top to make the most amount of money. So, it is not claiming to be making the most amount of money either. Well, all you gotta do is pick a nice rise, and, you know, a nice rise will be, uh, let's say, 10, 15, 20 percent in a few months, three, six months. Well, that's well better than the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the NASDAQ or anything else. So, yes, it's too late, but it doesn't claim to provide what is called perfect timing. Perfect timing is associated with the ability to pick the perfect bottom or the perfect top and to execute accordingly buy at the bottom or a sell at the top. It never meant that. So, again, it is a weakness, but it is a weakness that one learns to live with it and tries to see how to exploit it rather than say, yeah, just because it's weak or it doesn't pick the bottom stuff, we don't use it altogether. No, it still has good, appropriate uses. What's next? It's not infallible. Sure, it doesn't provide 100% reliable signals. But some signals are more reliable than others. 
and if you get a fairly reliable signal and you believe in it and you watch it carefully and you execute on it, you can make a decent amount of money. Well, a lot of DAO theorists are actually real good at it and they are steadily outperforming the market for decades. There is that legendary investor and DAO theorist, now called the DAO theorist Doyen, Richard Russell, he has beaten the market for five, six decades when he's in his late 80s, I think he just turned 90. So, he's a phenomenally sharp guy, and he beats the market. I mean, when they tell that the market's efficient, that's a joke. You have guys who consistently beat the market. They explain how they beat the market. They explain their theory. They write books. Every day this guy is writing. Well, this William Peter Hamilton, an out of Dow theorist. I mean, these guys are highly sophisticated, not sharp and sophisticated people, but in the real sense of the word, and they know what they're doing. All right, let's move on. Liz investor in Dow. Sure. Yes, this happens a lot of the times that in Dow theory, you're not sure. Is it still in the bull run or if the trend has changed? Is it already bottomed or is it, you know? So in other words, in Dow theory, you have a signal, buy signal, and you have a sell signal. But you also have confirmations. And sometimes you get the signal and you have to wait for three or six months for a, for a confirmation. Alternatively, you get what's called a divergence. It tells you that something's fundamentally wrong or the market doesn't behave well and you're in doubt. Of course, that's the case. Of course, that can happen even 20, 30, up to 50% of the time that you're in doubt. But nobody says you have to be invested all the time according to that. Hey, you invest only half the time, make these great returns when you're sure, when you have good, solid, consistent signals, and you're going to be beating the market every single year, okay? So, that's another criticism which is perfectly true, but it doesn't make the theory bad, okay? You have to understand what's what, what the weakness of the theory is, and you simply don't be invested all the time. Or, when you're in doubt, you provide some hedges or do some other techniques, or you shift your, the weight in your portfolio. What else? Not helpful to intermediate trend investors. Yes, absolutely true. So, for so-called swing traders and short-term traders, it is certainly not helpful. Dow theory works and works best and most for long-term trends or cyclical trends. It was never meant, never designed, and never developed for short-term trends. But there are other books and other theories which modify and specialize exclusively in short-term trading. If you may remember last time, I, uh, I brought you one book which was called Short-Term Trading. And that book specializes entirely on short-term trading. Now, it's a completely different book. Again, I'm not saying that other book works well or works poorly. I've read it. I've learned an awful lot of things. I'm just saying is what this theory is about and what it is not about. And if you're trying to use Dow theory for short-term trading, you're likely to fail miserably. So. This is a good tool for the long-term investor, but not a good tool for the short-term trader. What else do we have? Uh, reversal patterns. I will just name them because you will get some real nice illustrations coming. Head and shoulders is a typical uh, reversal pattern. Remember, you have continuation patterns and have a reversal pattern. A reversal pattern means that once you have had a major bull market, it will signal to you that probably the bull market is over and that you're getting in a bear market and vice versa. So, head and shoulders is one classical example. Another classical example is called exhaustion gaps, sometimes known as clean outs, sometimes known as washouts, sometimes known as capitulation. Uh, this today I'm not sure, but next time I'll show you a classical, perfect, uh, exhaustion, I was shocked to see perfect textbook stuff 
in the bond market happened last week. Oh, I think maybe this week. So it's Friday already. All right, so what about continuation? So you also have rounding tops. You also have rounding bottoms. Rounding bottoms are known as saucers and bowls. And rounding tops are known as inverted bowls. Again, I'll be showing them with real examples. Not yet, not yet. So, what do we have for continuation patterns? We have consolidations versus corrections. All right, let's explain the difference between a consolidation versus a correction. The best way to explain it is with a little chart. If you have, let's say, market goes up and then shoots up abnormally high, then you may have a correction. A correction means a substantial pullback and substantial give back of the major rise, let's say 30 to 70 percent. So if this is the initial initiation of the rise, and this is here at the top, you will have a correction if the fall back was anywhere between 30 and maybe 70 percent. So this we call a 50 percent correction, roughly the same size from the bottom to the top. That will be a Correction. So the correction is characterized by a sizable pullback in the opposite direction of the main trend. So then what is a consolidation? A consolidation is working and taking time with little pullback, but still not making any progress. So this will be a classical consolidation. So this is also known as high level consolidation. So sometimes markets correct, which means a substantial pullback. Sometimes markets idle, meaning they do nothing, but it's still a high level consolidation. Well, high level consolidation, consolidation and corrections are typical in bull as well as bear markets and therefore they're usually signals of continuation. You also have symmetric triangles, I'll be showing them. You also have pennants and you also have flags. The last point that I have prepared today is failed signals. According to Jack Schwager, other people don't really discuss this, but Jack Schwager emphasizes it. Sometimes markets, meaning technical signals, do fail. In other words, they tell markets breaking out, it's breaking up, it's moving up, and suddenly the signal fails and turns out that you got misled. According to Jack Schwager, when you have a failed signal, you must reverse your position from a long to a short and from short to a long and if you have a clear signal and undoubtedly that signal fail which can happen anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the time then the failure itself becomes the most important and the most reliable indicator of any other indicator in technical analysis we'll probably discuss some failed indicators uh, altogether all right, guys, do we have any questions or do we move with some examples and illustrations? Any, any questions in general? Any? All right. All right, so let's close this Word document. Then let's move on to Internet Explorer where we have them. Okay, so now we have the first one. Let's see. Uh, let's scroll to the top on the leftmost. So what are charts? All right, you see the chart is simply a price behavior. It simply over time gives you some chart. You have what is called a line chart. This is an example of a line chart. It just takes the closing points, the closing prices, and simply connects them with a straight line. So you have one major type is a line chart. Let's scroll down a little bit and see what's next coming up. Okay, so scroll some more. How to pick a time frame? The time frame, again, depends on the compression of data. You may have intraday, daily, weekly, monthly, and possibly quarterly on annual data. 
All right? So that's perfectly possible. Here, from what I read, we have weekly data. Okay? So this is weekly data. And you see each little line. So this is called a candlestick. I will be explaining in a few minutes separately candlesticks. So these are called candlesticks. Each candlestick represents one week. Let's scroll down more and see what do we have. All right, so you have 100 data points, and these are also called price bars. In this case, this is an example of candlesticks. And you can see November, December, and these are simply daily. So each candlestick represents a single day. Okay, let's see what else we have. All right, so cover charts form. The first example is a line chart. I already explained it. Let's move on to the next type of chart. The next type of chart is a bar chart. This little formation here is called a bar. You have on this by bar the high, which is the highest point. You have the low, which is the lowest point. You also have the close. And this little dash shows the close. So bar charts have two variations. High, low, close. And the other variation is high, low, open, and close. So this is of the high, low, closed sort. And you can see what was the range. So the highest point and the lowest point, we call the difference between the table. In other words, the length of the bar is called the daily price range. High price ranges are indicative of High volatility and low price ranges are indicative of fair, fair stability. You can see here low, you can see high, you can see the close. Let's scroll down to the next and see. You have open, high, low and close. So you must notice that the open has its bar to the left. The close always has the bar to the right. The high and the low are similar. So you have this chart and you can see this is where it opened and this is where it closed. This was a down day. In other words, it went down during the day. All right, so let's move on to the next one. All right, candlesticks. Candlestick is a nicer, better, more visual presentation of the bar. It contains the same information. It is mathematically identical. It still shows the high, the low, the open, and the close. But because you have this thing inside, we call this part the body, and you shade it or not shade it. In other words, if the body is empty, this represents that the close was higher than the open and if the body was red that the close was lower than the open the candlestick delivers the identical information but in a nicer better more visible pleasant to the eye and to the analyst's eye chart i first started out with the bars it took me quite a few months to learn how to actually read these, but once I got to learn them, I had to love them and never, ever in my life for the last seven or eight years get back to the previous types of charts. So, you're better off moving and learning straight the candlesticks and never get into the other stuff altogether. So, that's my advice. I'm going to be using for you know, a couple of lectures in exclusively candlesticks. You'll get the feel of them and you'll feel perfectly comfortable with them. So let's, so let's see, well, this is the body, you have the high, you have the close, you have the open, you have the low. How do you know which is the close, which is the open? Very simple, whether it's full body or whether it is empty body. So in this case, when it's empty, this was an up day, lower and higher. And when it's full body, it is the close here, you see? This is the main difference. So once you see a lot of full bodies, and in modern charting technology, the full body is in a red color. Once you get to see a lot of red and full bodies, it indicates that the market is somehow fundamentally weak. 
fundamentally, actually, I got to mean technically weak, kind of opens high and gets to, lows, uh, to close low. That's not a really good sign and not really bullish to invest in. All right, let's scroll some more. All right, you have point in figure charts. Honestly, guys, I've seen this a couple of times. I've seen it in one book, uh, possibly two charts. I never got to learn it and I never got to understand it. But there's one thing I know. Richard Russell uses not only candlesticks, but extensively this point in figure chart. He finds it a very helpful tool in the analyst toolbox. I never bothered, I never learned, I never understood. I can't really tell you how good or bad it is or what it does for you. But it exists and those who may become real top technicians and especially trade actively, you might benefit from learning and understanding it. Let's move on. All right, so price scaling. In technical analysis, it is very important how you scale. For very short-term charts, let's say three months is the full range, or maybe six months, or maybe one year, whether the scale here is linear or whether it's logarithmic, it doesn't matter that much, okay? But for some longer-term charts, whether it's linear or logarithmic makes a world of difference. The general rule is that the longer the term, the more you need the log scale. Well, there is a simpler rule of thumb. The log is always better. So you always use the log and never bother with the linear stuff, okay? So that's the simple rule. So you will see that once you have... Now, how do you know that it's log and not linear? Well, here is large difference. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. As each increment gets smaller than the previous one, you're most likely in logarithmic mode, okay? If the differences are identical, you're, let's just scroll a little bit. All right, so you see here the difference, 70, 80, 90, 100, 120, see? Here the differences are identical. If these differences are identical and the distance is identical, then you're in linear mode. All right, so what's the problem? This is the same graph and the same chart of, you see, very sign here, very sign, you'll see it's in the same range. But the problem with the linear is that linear does not show growth rates. Logarithmic shows growth rates. So here, when you draw this, we call this, if you remember from last time, a support trend line or a bull trend line, you see it doesn't touch nicely. On the other hand, you see it touches perfectly the support, uh, the trend line, it's also support line, it moves on higher and higher. So clearly this one, just when looking at the chart, is much better than this one. Well, how do we know it and how do we prove it? The answer is we don't prove it. We don't show it mathematically. It feels better. It feels right. So in technical analysis, we use a lot of intuition behind it. And that's why it's also a, an art. There is no steady mathematics to use for that, okay? But this looks nicer, this looks cleaner. All right, let's move on one other topic. Do, do you don't move is, remember what I was talking about here? Correction versus high level consolidation. Remember this concept? I see it right now on the chart over here. This here is a high level consolidation. So it went up, it didn't give up a lot, it consolidated over there. Of course, finally it gave up a lot, but you had a reversal here, so probably it went up. That's what a technician would usually expect from this stock here. That will be a perfect entry point from a technical point of view that you're buying in the 150, 160 range. That's how a technician would think. Let's scroll down any further, see what else we got. 
All right, so overall conclusions, we don't do this. So just close through the X, this, uh, yes, just close it, yes, go ahead. And let's move on and see now, uh, scroll down to see what we have here. Okay, so what we have here is an example of, you can see it yourself, seven month head and shoulders reversal. So what is a head and shoulder formation? Well, it is kind of like it goes upward, then it goes downward, then it goes upward again, a lot higher, then it goes downward, then goes upward, but not as high, and then downward. On the left hand side, it's called a shoulder, and in technical analysis, this is called the left shoulder. On this side, it's called the right shoulder. This here, which uses the support lines, is called a neckline. A neckline for head and shoulders formation may be perfectly horizontal, as it is on this example, but it may happen to be slightly upward or slightly downward, okay? It doesn't have to be perfectly horizontal. So, the very high point here is called the head. Now, this is a simplified picture. Uh, what's the point? The point is that the big Tao Theory book that I showed you last time spends seven or eight pages of the emotions of investors. As you have had a bull run for many months or many years, how did they feel here and how did we get to reach the shoulder? How did the correction went down? What was the sentiment? Who was buying? Who was selling? Then, how did this last spurt come about? In other words, what was the sentiment? Who were the buyers? Who were the sales? What were the volumes? In other words, it takes seven or eight pages of explanation to understand in depth what was the market sentiment. Who was buying? Who was selling? What were the market commenters? And what was the market interpretation? And the point is that in a true, genuine technical analysis, you don't just look at the picture of formation and the neckline, you draw and say, okay, this is what it is. You also follow the market, you also keep up with the news, and you keep up with the indicators that will help you to confirm that formation or deny. You had a question? If you have one shoulder, can you predict the head of another shoulder? Uh, well, well, well uh, again, if you're going to be predicting the right shoulder, maybe it will come, maybe it will not. This is where the criticism of some of the technical analysis is. You have to see that the second shoulder is forming, and once you're in this area, you have observed the second shoulder. shoulder. So here you should turn bearish. Once you get out of the neckline, that's a strongly bearish signal. So, this provides, this here provides a confirmation of the second shoulder. This breakdown, again, if it moves above the resistance, it is called a breakout. If it moves below the support, it is called a breakdown. This breakdown is a strong confirmation that indeed the formation was complete, that you're now reversing from an uptrend to a downtrend, and that you should be selling here, or if you don't have any positions, selling short. Another very important characteristic that is classic for the head and shoulders is once you have the full formation and there is the breakdown, the market doesn't just collapse down to zero. It always recovers for a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, to the neckline. It touches the neckline and then goes back to drift on the way down. At least that's the classical uh, interpretation, the classical formation. It is well explained in the book why this last recovery occurs, but I'm not going to get into that because I'll need a 15-week course and I budgeted only three weeks, all right? All right, let's scroll down and see what else we have. All right, this is a classical example. It's called a one-day outside reversal. It is known better in technical analysis as bearish engulfing. What is the bearish engulfing? You have a tiny little 
body over here, this is called the remember the body, which is bullish, and then you have a bigger body, and the bigger body completely covers not only the previous body, but completely covers the com range of the previous day. So, you take the, price, uh, the, uh, the range of the previous day, the body is even bigger, and this was an up day, and this was a down day. When you get this type of formation, it is called a bearish engulfing. So, this body here engulfs the previous day. That's a strong bearish indicator. One of two things. You either get out of it or you're watching and careful. See, portfolio theory doesn't give you that. Fundamental analysis doesn't give you that. This just tells you this is a high risk position at this point. Again, if you really want to use risk and portfolio techniques, you could because you put it a higher risk and if it's a higher risk, you lower your position correspondingly, okay? So that's one way to manage risk. Let's scroll down some more and see what we got. Okay, here's an oldie but goodie. Well, I don't see what the oldie and goodie is. Okay, this is an example here of an up well, trending line and an up sloping neckline, okay? Now that's another example of this formation. You also have here another, you see the formation. The point is, this is how it works. If you have a neckline, it has to come from below the neckline. And then it has to break down. And only then you consider the formation complete. If it's complete, then you turn a lot more bearish. So, Back to the point of it leaves you in doubt. Well, you're here, you're in doubt. You're here, you're in doubt. So, as long as you're above the neckline, you're in doubt. Again, just because it went down and below and you have a confirmation, it doesn't guarantee profits with 100%. But very likely, the odds that you're correct have moved from 50%, which is a flipping of a coin, or the choice of a monkey, to maybe 70, maybe 80%, okay? If you can move your odds from 50% to 70%, you're on your way to riches. Let's see what else we got, scrolling down. Okay, two dominant groups, I don't know what it means, but the chart is about trend channels. You see, because this is fairly long term, from 95 all the way to 2000, it is extremely important that you have the logs here. See, 5, 10, 15. You have $5 increments, but each increment is shrinking in distance. So this is strictly a log chart. You see clearly the formation, that's the lower trend channel, that's the upper trend channel, okay? You see it has been moving in this trend channel. The assumption as I explained from last time, alright, this is a bullish move, so as long as it has not penetrated on the downside, this one, you're in a bullish formation. So, how do technicians work? Well, they try to pick this point, they try to pick this point, well, you don't have the, the line here, but once you have the formation, this is a great entry point, and this is a great entry point. Of course, this is a good one, and this is a good one. If you get to see that it goes up and you're making money, so be it. That's good. But in case it goes down and breaks below 45 and moves into the 40, you have a clear indication that the trend line, or the, in this case the trend channel, has been violated. That's how we call it. It's violated. It's also called broken. Once it is broken, two things you do. If you have a long position, by all means liquidate. That's what a technician will do. An aggressive technician, investor or speculator, once he sees a breakdown into the 40s, low 40s, he will short the stock. Okay? So technicians often will take the position here, the market will cheat them, it will break down, well, then you liquidate, you take a loss, you short and hope 
for the better. At least technical indicators tell you that the odds are with you, not the gods. The odds, right? The probabilities are with you. All right, so let's scroll down any further and see what we got. All right, well, there's nothing. Move on, move on. No, okay, that's good enough, that's good enough. All right, so you have introduction to candlesticks. So you have a, this is the bar, high, low, open, close. Let's scroll further and see what we have. Candlestick charts explained. All right, you guys should take your own time to read through these explanations on your own. I have posted them on the course website. You go on the course website, then you click into the uh, technical analysis, then you click into the theory, you can open up themselves, okay? So, you get those explanations. Here is some more details. This is called the low. This one here, this part, is called the lower shadow. This part here is called the upper shadow. And this is called white real body. So, this in general is called the body. Well, the body is of two types. A white real body. Let's scroll down and see what we get. We also get the black real body. So, it's got its own name. So, an engulfing is when the black real body completely contains within itself the full candlestick from the previous day. Let's scroll some more and see what we have. Alright, so, bars compared to candlesticks, the concept here is this is equivalent to this, graphically. But this is nicer to see and nicer to interpret, okay? See the difference? Same thing. Here, this is equivalent to this, but this is nicer to see and nicer to interpret. Let's scroll further now. Alright, so, what is common candlesticks terminology? Number one, this is simply called black candlestick. Just common sense terminology, nothing more. Let's move on. Well, you call this white candlestick. Again, let's scroll down. This configuration is called shaven head. Shaven head means that the shadow, remember this part up here? Okay, this part up here is called the, you know, the shadow. The upper shadow is completely missing. So, this is called the shaven head. So, sometimes when you read the technician, they'll say, well, you gotta watch for the shaven head, whatever. Well, this is what it means. Let's scroll down any further. Well, now this is the opposite. You have a shaven bottom. Alright. Let's scroll down. Alright, this is called spinning top. So, a spinning top, you can actually read it, is a candlestick with real small bodies. In other words, the real body is small. So, the shadows are huge and the real body is small. Okay, when appearance are raised on a chopping market, they represent equilibrium between bulls and bears. They can be either white or black. So, here is for you guys an interpretation. You gotta, you know, read some of these on your own if you want to be a little more sophisticated than just trying to pass the, you know, this course. Let's move on. So, this is called dotted lines. The body has shrunk to a single line, effectively. You know, dotted lines have no real body, okay? It's just a line. It simply means that the market closed exactly where it opened. That's the interpretation. But it has some other. Okay, so let's talk about, see if the guy's got some candlestick. Reversal patterns, scroll down. All right, this configuration here is called the hammer. Remember, it was the shaven head. It's a hammer. That's a typical reversal pattern. Again, a candlestick, whatever it is, you got to read it on your own, but that's the basic idea. You see this type of pattern in here, then you're in a reversal pattern. All right, let's scroll down. This is called a hanging man. I mean, that's the, you know, the head of the guy. It's kind of a hanging guy. This was an up move. And once you see the hanging man, you got to watch out. This and this and previous, these techniques are better for short-term traders as opposed to the long-term traders, okay? So these are good if you're trying to day trade the market, well, more like swing trade the market and, and take positions for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. All right, so engulfing patterns. 
Remember, this we already had. This is, in this case, bullish engulfing line. So this is a bullish engulfing pattern. And probably there will be a bearish engulfing. So bearish engulfing, you see what it looks like. Let's see, dark cloud. So this is called dark cloud cover formation. Again, the point I'm trying to make is with candlesticks, you have roughly 15, 20 standard formations which technicians typically use and you should be more or less familiar with them or watching out for those, okay? So, let's go further down. Or right, have piercing patterns and so forth. All right, let's close this one. I have a star. Uh, probably let's we just close and you guys will take a look at it on your own. All right, so you have candlesticks and resistance. Let's scroll and see what we have here. All right, this represents here, this red line, represents a classical example of resistance. There was one resistance here, there was another one here. This is a confirmed resistance, and this yet is a confirmed resistance. We will have, we will have probably today, maybe next time, a discussion on gaps. But once you have a resistance holding, and then you see a gap, and a gap is simply that the high point is well below the low point, so the gap is this space here. This is typically a fairly bearish sign. So, a resistance holding for three times is usually not a good sign, but once you get into the gap here, you have a good indicator that very likely you are in a bearish mode. So once you see the gap, you should sell, or if you don't have any positions, sell short. So selling and selling short proves to be, at least so far up to here, a good move. Let's see what happens now. All right, so you have dark clouds, uh, marks of resistance. That's an example, and that's an example. When you have these dark clouds, and here is the key. In combination with a resistance line, that's usually a signal for a trading pattern. Once you get down to the support, you buy on the way up. Once you get to the resistance, you sell. So sometimes within the channel, you try to play the channel. Again, so here is an example. You have the support, and you have the support, and you have the support. Once you break through the support, very likely you're in a bearish trend. You should be selling short. Here is a key. What would be the typical expectations of a technician at this point? Of course, it may prove wrong, but the expectation is that this will recover back to the 42. Uh, now, now, this was a support. The support becomes resistance, and from 42 we will slide back down to substantially lower levels. That's how te a technician would work. How much more time we got, guys? Was it 5-10 minutes? Alright, let's scroll down and see what else we got. Alright, so this is an illustration of shooting stars mark resistance. Let's scroll down, probably nothing more, let's close it. Okay, so support and resistance. Okay, again, what I'm trying to do is show you guys some examples. You can see this is these are these are not made up examples. This is Amazon, Amazon from September to March 2000. Okay, so you see this was a res uh, this was a, in this case a support, another support, another support. Now, one important interpretation within Dow theory is that if you have a move away by 3% within the line, you do not have a violation. So, is this within 3%? Sorry, if it were within 3%, it's not a problem. How much is 3%? Out of $60, what is 3%? $2, right? $1.80. So, if the support is at 60 and you're within 62, there is no violation. In other words, Dow theorists have worked hard for many decades to find out what is the tolerance level. 
and the tolerance level is roughly plus minus 3%. So this does not represent any violation. This does not represent any violation. So, so far you have what is called a valid support. Let's scroll down and see what else we get. All right, so where is, the, where is resistance? Okay, so here is an example of a resistance. Now, one technician might further say, a different guy, that, okay, here's a second line above here. So this whole area from here to here in the 77 area. So what they'll say is from 75, from 77, will say that it is a resistance area. So, you have a resistance line, if it is at one price level, you have a resistance area. Let's scroll down any further and see what you have. So, what is it? Okay. So, highs and lows. Again, the idea here is that this was here a major support. This major support was confirmed over here. And the support turned it once, then twice into resistance. Again, you can read more. What's so funny, guys? Right. Again, you can read more of it or your own interpretations. Let's scroll down and see what else we have. Support equals resistance. Again, the same concept. This was the resistance. Once, two, three times turned into a support level. Let's scroll down any further. Let's see what it is. Okay, you see, this was a classical support level. It broke down and once, second time, third time it proved into a resistance. Now you have the same thing here. You see, it broke down and went back to this. Now support level turns into a resistance. A second time turns into a resistance. So what you have is what technicians call zones of support and resistance then another zone of support and resistance. So what you're moving is from one area which represents an area of support and resistance to another one. So a market would usually make progress by moving from one area to another and then to another higher and then to another higher. Okay? So that's a typical, it's called technical advance. Well, could be in this case technical decline if it goes down here and goes any further down. Alright, let's scroll and see what else. Alright, training range. When you have two support in two resistance levels and these are horizontal, it is called a training range. In Dow theory, when this training range is very narrow or relatively narrow, it is called a line. So when you have a training line the gen or training range, the general rule is simpler. Simple. The longer it trades within the range, the more powerful will be the way out, whether the way out is on the downside or the upside. So you may have three, five, seven years in a trading range. The answer is once you get out of the trading range on the way upside, the upside move later will be very strong. It simply means that you have a built-in or pent-up demand for it and once it breaks out, it breaks out big time, alright? Or once it breaks down, it's going to likely collapse fast. Let's scroll down some more and see what we have. Alright, so, okay, you see an example. This is an example of breakdown. See, this was a huge collapse over here. So this is in December in December and early January of 2000, so it tells you that the stock is in trouble. So you see now a new formation, so you see one formation here, you see a second formation here, you see a third formation here. Let's scroll any further. Support and resistance zone. Okay, so this one is talking about zones. So here, this represents the one zone, and here, this represents the other zone. This will be the resistance zone and this will be the support zone. So, excuse me, the point is that not only you may have one single line, but it may be more of a range. Again, you say, well, this is fairly simple stuff and a kid can learn it. 
Well, that's how you get 17-year-old kids to become market traders in 1998 and 1999. It's not sophisticated stuff, so they get to learn it. But again, if you're going to be trading and investing entirely on this stuff, you're not going to succeed or likely will fail in trading. You'll need a lot more tools than this. Again, you'll need market sentiment, you need fundamentals, you need some portfolio analysis, you need some risk management. That will be some other time. Let's scroll down. Okay, so we know up to where we are. It's time over for today. All right, then we're done for today. Push the button. Austrian, the Austrian School of Economics.